it's very, very sad to me that the unions are getting pushed down because, I mean, I made a very good wage. And I had a lot of pride being a carpenter, too, as a Finnish woodworker. And I, I, I loved it. And people loved it, you know, and it had some it had some cachet to it. Welcome to the Construction Disruption Podcast, where we uncover the future of building and remodeling. I'm Ryan Bell of Isaiah Industries, manufacturer of specialty metal roofing and other building materials. And today my co-host is Ethan Young. Ethan and I are typically the behind the scenes crew on the production of each episode, but we are filling in today for Todd and Seth, and we are both excited for the opportunity to co-host this episode. Our goal here at Construction Disruption is to provide timely and forward-looking information regarding the construction industry. As part of that, we look at innovations as well as trends and practices, building materials, the labor market, and leadership. Today, our guest is Linda Lide, America's home improvement expert. Linda has been a trailblazer in both television and carpentry. Having learned and perfected her trade as a finished carpenter through the United Brotherhood of Carpenters, Linda received her contractor's license in 1993 and soon launched her own construction company, West Village Construction, specializing in apartment renovations in New York City. She has the great distinction of being the first woman to win the Golden Hammer Award in New York City's Carpenters Union. In 1997, Linda was cast by the Discovery Channel as one of television's only licensed female carpenters on Give Me Shelter. She went on to host more than 350 home improvement shows for HGTV, the Discovery Channel, and the DIY Network. Winning two Telly Awards, Linda has produced and hosted segments for CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, ABC, NBC's The Today Show, and many other national and local television shows. Linda has also written two books, Linda Lide's Do It Yourself and A Homeowner's Manual. Aside from being a master carpenter, Linda's other love is sketch comedy, where she has developed a web series called Ask Big Lou, which can be found at askbiglou.com. Linda, it's a pleasure to have you as our guest today. Thank you. Wow. Now we have to wake up everybody after that long. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of long, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So let's get into it. Um, okay. So uh, my first question for you is, uh, what brought you into the field of carpentry and construction, and especially at a time when very few women were entering our trade? You know, I get that a lot. You want to know the real story or you want to know the abridged version? The real story. Yeah, I think we have time for that. Okay, the real story. So um, I grew up in Atlanta. And uh, as a little girl, I, um, you know, I just loved to I love tools, but I wasn't allowed to touch any tools. And um, I mean, literally, it was like, you know, it was very segregated, like the boys do this and the girls do this. So all of this, my career could have changed the trajectory of my life would have changed. If my mother had let me take shop class in high school, I'm convinced. Um, or maybe not, who knows. But anyway, I took home ec, which I am so grateful that I know how to use a sewing machine, which is fantastic to, you know, if you're creative and you need to make yeah. something. Um, yeah. And and it's all the same, by the way. If you, uh, you know, and, and because it was so categorized, you know, growing up, um, I can say now that you know, sewing patterns and understanding there's so much uh, geometry in patterns and, and dressmaking pants, whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, and it's really the same thing in carpentry. So, um, it, but, you know, there was something about the smell of wood and the feeling that I had inside um, when I started working with it. So anyway, I moved to New York. I moved to New York to be an actor. And I didn't know anybody and I didn't know exactly how to do that. I know that uh, I had a real love for it, um, but I was a little bit lost and I was doing what every actor does, which is, you know, working in restaurants. And um, I had this, uh, this one evening, I went over to someone's home and I put my hand over this beautiful, like cherry wood. The, the cabinets were made out of cherry wood and this beautiful countertop was made out of cherry wood. And something came over me and I just was like, oh my gosh, I want to be a carpenter. 
So um, I went back to my my uh, restaurant and the manager, her name was Frida. And she says, well, you know, if you go into the unions, they teach you and they pay you well. And I didn't know anything about unions because I grew up in Atlanta. So um, we were, you know, I came from a family that was like, those unions are bad. And uh, so then in New York, it was like, these unions are fantastic. They pay you well, they train you. And I just really like, I mean, I was, I was young. I was so young. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll just call the nearest place. This is when all five boroughs were 212. So you didn't know where you were calling, right? The 212 being the area code. And so I just picked the one that was near Park, you know, Avenue, which is, I was living in uh, a Gramercy Park in a woman's residence there. And um, it, it went right into the Bronx number. Um, and this is where the miracle happens because to get a, um, to, to get a, 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 a an agent on the phone with you, which is a business agent, um, w- w- is just like, I mean, you probably be able to get a line to God, you know, easier. Seriously, they <laughs> never answer the phone. Never and call you back. Mar- yeah, Marcello Savidas. He was, you know, Italian. And, um, and unfortunately, he's not with us any longer. But he couldn't believe that I was calling. And so he said, well, if you're really serious, you know, come on up here and uh, let me uh, talk to me in person. And I got on the bus and I went up there and I met him and I put on the most, you know, worst clothes that, you know, holes in my pants, you know, just faded jeans. And um, and he says, hold on just a minute. And he made a phone call and I went down to the school and I was able to get into the union school without a job. And then I had to shape a job. So that's how I got in. It was all angels and higher power stuff out of my control. I just did the actions that Frida said, hey, call a union. And then I just kept saying, yes, yes, yes. And that's how that happened. Wow. That's a really cool story. And I really like how you kind of tied sewing to... (laughs) carpentry and woodworking. I have always wanted to learn how to sew. And my oldest stepdaughter is super talented at like making clothes and and with a sewing machine. And I'm always interested, like, Hey, like one day I am going to have her teach me just because I think it is one of those, you know, talents that could come in handy in so many different ways. So that's really cool. You're right. And you know, the, the, you know, the other thing too, you know, like baking, Yeah. because I remember being on the job site and these guys were like, I don't cook. And they were making cement and they were mixing (laughs) glue from powder. You know what I mean? I'm like, right. You can cook. Yeah. This is exactly cooking, like knock it off. Right. So you just got to follow some instructions. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. I was just to say, like when you're talking about the sewing, like I remember growing up, my grandpa and my grandma both knew how to sew. Really? So like we made a toy boat with my grandpa one time and we needed a sail. So he cut up like a piece of an old white t-shirt and sewed the sail for us. So yeah, it was kind of something they both had and, and they passed it down to my mom. I've never sewed anything, but I think my sister's done a little bit of it. So maybe I'll have to try sometime. Yeah. And, and if you're going to make something like if you're camping and you want to have like this awning that comes off your tent and you bring it to your, t- like, how do you do that? Right. Do you sew it? There's all different ways to put fabric together. And it's not necessarily with the thread. There's all different kinds of mastics now that you can use and stuff like that. So, yeah. it And, and I also think as we've gotten so modern, um, I think the older generation sometimes would meld those things, men and women, right? Like, you know, yeah. men did have to make sales, right? And so that is sewing. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, back to a focus on carpentry. What is it that you enjoy the most about it? Two things. I think there's two things. And they're probably equal. And in, in as far as priority, I love the fact that I don't think about anything except what I'm doing. So it's a very zen feeling to, to, to be focused like that. And the other thing that I love about it is I love being able to know how to fix something and how to do stuff. Uh, there's an independence that comes over me 
really early on. And now it's just that I just accept it, that that's the way it is. But I notice it in my friends and men and women, and they're like, I put the shelf up myself. And it's that feeling of, well, I can do that, you know? So I think, I I think it gives me a lot of um, self-confidence and it gives me a feeling of independence as well as all the noise goes here. And I'm, you know, laser focused on something there. So that it's, you know, I don't know. It's kind of like meditation, I suppose, a little bit. No, I completely understand it. That, you know, there, there's such a, a sense of accomplishment that comes from being able to build stuff or f- figure stuff out like that, too. That, right. That it, it is really something you don't get anywhere else. So, yeah. Very cool. Um, so your career has uh, really taken you a lot of different places over the years. Um, was, um, the, the path that you've been on planned or has it kind of developed more in a organic way and you've just kind of followed along and followed the path where it led you? So I, I think there's like a two, well, there's more than two people, but I think in this instance, there's two people, right? There's people that I grew up with people that they knew exactly what they wanted to do and what they wanted to be when they were younger. Right. Mm -hmm. I am not that person. I have been on the, I've been the person that just goes with the frequency that is at hand, basically. So uh, I could have never seen myself as a carpenter. I just kept doing the next right thing that was, that felt like the next right thing. So, and I kept saying yes, when opportunity came my way, or like when Frida said, hey, if you want to be, you know, you want to learn how to do carpentry. You know, and then and then I was like, well, how do I get a job? Well, you have to shape the jobs. Now, me, very young, going to these high rises, 85 Broad Street, down in Wall Street before it was 85 Broad Street, right? Before it was Goldman and Sachs, it was, you know, being built. And I go on these jobs, dusty jobs. There's no women on these floors, right? And going in, and it's called shaping a job. So you go on, you know, you go and find out who the foreman is and say, hey, do you need help? You know, so I just kept doing the next right action. And fortunately, I was young enough to not think about it so much. You know, like there's something wonderful about youth is like, oh, I can do that. Oh, I don't care what you think. You know, <laughs> right. Thing, not much so. risk when you're younger. Right, right. Who can't like what? What's the worst thing that can happen? Right, right. So yeah, so that's uh, um, I guess that's it. You know, I mean, I I never saw myself. I I guess I have to say that I've always been a fairly lucky person. Um, I feel like I keep saying that I'm lucky. I know the brain works in a way that it pulls in whatever you question your brain is looking for the answer so i always say to my brain why am i so lucky so i can just keep pulling in luck right <laughs> so and and what is what is luck you know it's opportunity and a lot of hard work on the back end of it just kind yeah. of intersecting and going yes and and freaking out later i mean i've done that over and over and over where i just say oh yeah i can do that and I have no idea how to do that. I'm sure you guys. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I've been, I've done that before. Yeah, I'll figure it out later. And I think you know, I think men can. I think men are kind of able to do that a lot. I kind of learned a lot from men working with men because I notice that men do that a lot. They just go, they go like, you know, we need to put that. Can you put that soffit in and blah 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 and you know do. It. And they're like, yeah. And then when the foreman leaves, they're like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. And I love that. And I was like, I can't. Well, heck, I can do that. You know, yeah. <laughs> Figure it out as you go. Yeah, that's right. Um, are you still actively involved in construction in any way? Well, according to my body, I am. I was just in the attic all week to because I'm trying to get my attic. And uh, um, I had to cap off some three vents that were up there. I do a lot of stuff myself for myself. Um, but I'm working with Home Shopping Network, so I still have my contractor's license. Um, it's in New York, and right now I'm in Florida to do my Home Shopping Network because I'm close by in proximity. Um, but when you're a carpenter, it's like being a car mechanic. There's no retirement. You never retire. It's like you're always using your ability. 
Um, I love helping out my friends when I can help them out. And, and um, so I'm not a contractor necessarily, but I am actively a, a carpenter doing odd jobs here and there. Yes. Taking care of stuff. Yeah. Well, that's good. That, you know, that'll probably keep you young for a long time. <laughs> Tell that to my knees now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know it can be hard on your body, but um, my uh, father-in-law is as a farmer, and just he just turned eighty, um, eighty or eighty-five, maybe eighty-five. Um, but he's he's you would never guess it because he's always just worked so hard and still does, still goes out, takes care of his cows, and um, yeah. So keep moving, right? I mean, seriously, I think that's it. To just right. keep the body moving. Although I was in, um, I had to, I had to cap off and take the duct work off of three, three areas on this box up in my attic. And I was in a fixed position for 40 minutes. And I thought I was, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't move. I'm Stuck. like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm not 20 anymore. Am I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So having been in this industry for nearly 30 years, what are some of the biggest game changers you have seen over the years? Well, just so much. I mean, so much in building. I mean, the uh, member when it was um, arsenic, chromium and copper and pressure treated wood, right? And they got rid of the arsenic. Yeah. You know, remember, you know, like, so things like that. So better techniques, um, better material uh, there always seems to be a new glue or mastic that's out. That's just, I just got some kind of incredible glue that is just so cool. It's, uh, it, I, I got it for rubber, actually, to, for rubber really? and plastic. And it is amazing. It's black. Um, and, and the hold and the strength is just incredible. So things like that. And I think also that uh, we have so much smart innovation, right? The electronics. I just put in a um, a uh, attic gable vent with the thermostat on it, and I was like, "Oh, this is so cool!" You know, you just so that kind of stuff. I think is really, really um, neat. And uh, I guess the the biggest innovation for me that's helping me is YouTube videos. Pretty uh, incredible what you can do with YouTube, huh? Is that amazing, right? Yeah. I mean, you type in anything. If you are, if you have the DIY brain that can understand things, I've now, I, I tease with my friends that I want to become an auto mechanic because I have a 2002 Jeep Grand Cherokee and I've had to fix everything on it now because, sorry, Chrysler, you guys were just gouging me <laughs> and not fixing it. Yeah, you're you're right. That that has really changed the game, especially in terms of being able to. My dad was always very hands on and very, um, you know, we're 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 not going to pay somebody to do that. We can figure out how to right. do how to do it. Um, and just like you said before, he wouldn't know how to do something, but he sure as heck wasn't going to pay somebody else right. to do it. He was going to figure it out. And so I I learned a lot of the skills uh, I have for doing stuff around the house from him. But I still love YouTube. I still go to YouTube anytime I need to do something. Something. It's incredible how much you can really accomplish by yourself now if you're the least bit handy even um, with what's on Isn't YouTube. Isn't it amazing? Do, do, do both of you guys use YouTube? To oh, yeah. I was going to tell you, I, my first car was a 1998 Honda Civic, and I had some fun mistakes with that that I had to YouTube some videos on. I, I knocked one of the side mirrors off, and turns out you have to take the whole door panel off to get to the side mirror, so YouTube right. helped with that. Um, yeah. It's been it's been vital in a lot of interesting ways. I mean, I, I you know, I, I use it for entertainment too, but there's a lot of great helpful content on there too, so. Absolutely. I mean, I I pause. I mean, I've worked on my car and 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 even with construction sometimes I'm like, well, I've never really done this before. I worked a lot in uh commercial, you know, construction. So I didn't have a lot of residential, you know, experience uh, in 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 my training. So a lot of times, and with the new products, it's like, how does this thing work? Well, about five videos that are going to show you. So. Right, especially the electronic stuff that needs set up or exactly. YouTube's easier than reading the manual usually. Absolutely, I think that's something we found for our company too that a lot of people really get a lot out of YouTube videos for installation. It just makes a big difference. I mean, you know, paper manuals are great and they can be a big help, but, you know, good 
solid YouTube videos are just so helpful. Right. And they can rewind it and go back over a part that they missed. And it's, yeah, they're just invaluable. Yep. Um, with the, the experience that you've had, I, I, I went through and looked on your website and I saw that you had a line of tools specifically for women. And that got me thinking, um, I wanted to ask, how do you think that that has changed the construction industry in general has changed with its uh, kind of acceptance or views towards, you know, allowing women? Because, you know, you were definitely a trailblazer in that area. And I was just kind of thinking about I had a situation when I was younger, the same grandpa that, you know, taught us to do a lot of that stuff, gave tools to me and my sister and my brother. So we all got tools when we were younger. We had slightly different ones, but it really didn't matter that you know, she was a girl. She still got her own toolbox with her name on it and everything. So, right. You know, I interviewed Jimmy Carter and, uh, I was asking, uh, you know, about his wife. I was like, it's something about, you know, their tools, do they share their tools? And he's like, Oh no, she has her own toolbox. <laughs> and I don't go near it. <laughs> like, yeah, that's right. Um, so what's the question? I guess the seeing the different line of tools just inspired me to think, is it, you know, is it more common? Has it been more accepted for women to be in construction more often? How do you think that's changed over the last, you know, how couple decades that you've been doing this? I think it has changed a little bit, right? We, we, um, I get upset when I see, oh, we're going to like put pink on some, you know, crummy tools and then sell it to women it's and that's what i tried to look online to see some and i, I ran into some of those yeah that that's always been my big beef right like no and um i'm still i'm you know i still have the hope for light a tools because um i've you know had a series of fundraising and if you've ever done fundraising i came this close on completely funding everything three different times one person died another person had a ruling at their bank that it couldn't you know had they couldn't do anything under six million so it was like all these different things like that you couldn't have seen and it went so uh and had great meetings with home depot and all that so um anybody sees us and would like to you know help fund this fantastic please call me um but i think that it's still not here like what they what they've done, and if you look at any of the uh, surveys, um, women are the 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 purse strings to the purchases. The majority of the purpose purse uh, purchases at uh, all the you know Ace, Home Depot, Lowe's, all of them they come from women, and uh, they they do control the decisions, and a lot of money come comes out of the pocketbooks instead of you know the men's wallet. So. Um, I don't know. I just, I, it's still very male. It's very blinded. Um, we have, we have different bodies and abilities. And, and if you take the average woman, you know, when the average woman has enough money to have her own home and whatever, and I've always, whether I have a rental or I own my own home, I'm still going to fix it up and do stuff. And you know, and especially with this pandemic, you know, we had, there was that stranger danger that women always face. And now it was like, you know, virus danger and having somebody come in. So now even more, we need to, you know, get back to learning how to do, you know, things ourselves. And I still feel that it's women are underserved in this industry. What do you guys think from guys? Well, I mean, from a man's point of view, what do you think? No doubt. I agree with what you're saying. We, um, a couple episodes ago, um, shoot, I'm drawing a blank on their names, but the people out in Seattle, do you remember Ethan? Oh, uh, was it Mary and Jason? Yes. That? Yes. Mary and Jason Sturgeon. They, they have a, uh, like a, a program where, where they help try to, do you remember what it's called? I don't remember their exact, I remember the business's name, but it's like, it's kind of a consulting thing that they do. And then they also run like a, an academy that helps kind of underserved demographics and construction, find a home, find a company that they can do, kind of train them. It, it's like a project manager and a foreman training that they offer. And they, they find a lot of people are interested in it. They've been able to help pair a lot of those people with companies that want to work with them. So it's definitely a, an underdeveloped area, I think, still. Well, it's interesting. Don't you think, what do you guys think about the fact that we're, we're, we're becoming such a society of this, right? It's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. Hours and hours. Now we have like, you know, a, bill, a way to clock how many hours we're looking on our screens. And 
what's happening to these trades? Like what's ha- like, you know, at a certain point where, you know, are, are people getting that kind of understanding? And that's why, you know, I, I was thinking about YouTube. Thank goodness that's around because that is a vocational training center. Right. Right. So my wife and I have four kids and we, you know, are constantly battling the the phones in the hands and the headphones in and the, you know, we don't allow them to be on a lot of that social media crap. Right. Um, and we do watch their screen time. But I'm always, I always say I've learned more from YouTube and half the time than I ever learned while I was in college. And so if they want to watch something and learn how to do something right. and do it, I am all about that. Please do that. If they're going to watch mindless video, you know, that's okay for a little bit to kind of escape the world if you need to, or you need a little break to, for some R and R and whatnot. But, um, you know, I guess, I guess the phones in our hands and this technology we have can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. Right. And it's all about controlling that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think things are just so freely accessible that, you know, on the same platform, we're talking about YouTube, the same platform, you can spend hours and hours on entertainment or you can spend it on, I think it's just that free accessibility makes it so easy. And I do think it is kind of one of those things where it's a little bit of a loop, like the less you do it, the less you're interested in it, people around you are interested in it less, and it kind of just fuels that. But I definitely think there's still, you know, it's not an irreversible thing. There's definitely a lot of people that can find that passion for whatever it is that's DIY or right. or learning. So Good stuff. Well, on to the next question. Um, what do you feel will be some of the big disruptors coming up over the next 20 or so years? Um, what are some of the things you think we maybe need to keep an eye out for? I think um, what I'm excited about is all the prefabrication yeah. that's happening. It's been a big topic, yeah. Right? You know, everything that's being made in a hermetically sealed area that can come in and then just go clunk, you know, and all the, um, I should say, the, the smart building, but, you know, having everything just be in line with saving energy uh, and 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 helping out with uh, the environment and just so many different things. It's so neat when I've um, I- I'm fascinated by. Remember when the container, you know, the containers. Everybody was building homes because containers were so inexpensive. But now yep. <laughs> I don't think that's the case yeah, anymore. No. But <laughs> um, but but pretty cool, right? Yeah. So this it's it's how to use things and and so much of it is we you know like the containers was such a workaround because you didn't have to you know because it was mobile you didn't have to pay certain taxes and all this different you know these different things about them that was kind of cool so i i think it's re- really modular building that i think is going to be really really interesting you know when you see these trusses that are they come all formed and it's just like boom 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 then a house is up um and built so much better too and that's the other thing we have got to build our homes stronger and better for these storms that are coming up i mean this is getting to be serious yeah we're getting worse every year mhm right yeah, I was just editing a transcript from an episode we did maybe a month ago or so, but it was a company called RSG3D that does this concrete and wire mesh for their their structures, and it's very tough. It's like can withstand like any storm, basically any earthquake, and wow, it's something that you know it's very easy to put up. It takes way less time. It's way it weighs less. It's safer for you. It's safer for the environment. It's, so there's a lot of great companies and products out there. I do think that. Even from what we've seen, just talking to a couple of different companies about it, there's there's some really talented people and solutions that are coming out. So we have a lot to look forward to with that. You know, it's interesting, too, because only time can tell what things are. Like, well, remember asbestos. Oh, it's the best thing in the world. And then, wait a minute, this is causing so many problems, you know, and um, the, the that drywall that came out of China, that was, you know, what wasn't good. So we never know. Like, it's like, you know, we get really advanced and then time keeps up with, with you know, time comes at us and then we realize, uh oh, this isn't so good. So that's all that's always interesting as these new innovations like come in. But, you know, maybe they just found better ways to to, to test them. And um, and, you know, it's all about, you know, speed and durability and environment. So those th- I'm fascinated 
by that kind of thing. I'm fascinated by how things are, you know, just can go up so quickly now. I mean, look at the Amish. I mean, that talk about impressive. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother a whole nother topic there. Conversation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're they're amazing carpenters, just great. So um one of the largest topics in construction the last few years has been the the shortages of skilled tradespeople and not enough people entering this line of work. Um what are your thoughts on that? Is it something that you think will get better or or will the labor so- shortage kind of force us to change how we build and remodel? Well, you're talking about to a woman who was trained by the union, um, and uh, and I was in the uh, the Irish, the Irish local. Happy St. Patty's Day! Yes. Um, and um, so, being a union uh, a tradeswoman, um, I have to say that it's very, very sad to me that the unions are getting pushed down because. To have, I mean, I made a very good wage as a, as a New York carpenter, as a, you know, young person. And I had a lot of pride being a carpenter too, as a Finnish woodworker. And I, I, I loved it and people loved it, you know, and it had some, it had some cachet to it. And what's happened now is it's this mind, it's this whole attitude around uh, blue collar workers, right? Like, like there's something wrong there. And, um, and yet when the, you know, what goes down, guess who everybody needs, right? Everybody needs the mechanic. Everybody needs the car. Oh, I don't have air conditioning. You know, it's all that kind of stuff. So, um, I'm really pro union. Uh, there's a lot wrong too that happened with the unions, right? It's like anything. It's like the si- Unions are the same like government. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of crooks and there's a lot of good stuff. But, you know, how do we get back to making a really good wage? The problem with trades people now is that they keep getting undercut and undercut. I'm in Florida and and people here don't know a good carpenter. They really don't. You know, it's like if a door closes, you know, it's for, you know, well, it closes, you know, it doesn't matter that there's a big gap on the top or it's, you know, so it, it, that, that this is tough uh, for me to just, you know, be like, oh, well, you know, we need to be. No, I think it. I, I'm really pro union on this when it comes, because I'll tell you something, as someone who went through a four year training college in the union and someone who was, you know, we had a level and we had to meet that there were standards and there were standards to meet in building and codes. And we knew the right steel to use and the right, you know, where to get our products from so that it, you know, wouldn't come down and the the screws wouldn't, you know, break off. So we had all this instruction. And when I build something and I put something in, you can better believe that thing is not going to move when I leave. I'm not coming back. I do, you know, that's how I was taught. Like, don't come back to fix this. Do it right the first time. Right. And um, so th- there you have it. There's I'm a real I'm I, I, I don't know any other work around around it because it was a very it's a it's a good training. And then it's, um, you know, you're 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 in a a bubble of good, safe practices. I remember working in a, 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 a with a company that wasn't that wasn't union and it was they had faulty ladders and scaffolding and they were doing all this stuff and I had to walk off the site and I said I'm going to kill myself. What a huge 30 foot drop, you know, that I'm working off. I'm not doing this. So I don't know. I think um I think we have to change our attitude about the the the, the blue collar and I think if we paid the blue collar you know, back to what they deserve and, and, you know, and, and have some kind of structure there. I don't know. That's how I feel about that. 100%. I, I completely agree. I think the, the stigma around it needs to change. And I, I do think it is. I mean, I think at some point it's kind of naturally going to force itself to, because there, there is going to be, uh, well, hopefully the wages do kind of go up because they're going to need to, to be able to entice people into the trades. But, um, right. Yeah. And, and you know what, you know what you said about the quality of work, not being 
great, you know, and people not caring. That's something that drives me nuts too, about having somebody come into my house to do something. I kind of have the mentality that it won't get done right unless I do it. Right. Yeah. That's a, a very good answer. I agree with everything you said. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is thinking of entering the construction field? I would say that to be a standout, one of the things that uh, helped me as an apprentice, because, you know, you have to learn the trade, right, mm -hmm. um, is, you know, to show up on time and to be okay with being bossed around. You know, it's very, I have to say I've loved working with guys because guys are like, hand me that, get me that, do this, do that. And I've worked with women, you know, like different friends or whatever. And, you know, it's like, get me this. And you don't have time to say please at everything, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> so I would say um, just like knock it off, like with all the, oh, you know, you just told me what to do. No, you just have to. I mean, I was, oh, my God. So I worked with the Irish, right? So the Irish, the Italians and the Germans were big in the industry, in the woodworking uh, industry in New York, right, in the unions, and amazing carpenters. And they didn't know what to do. And, I, you know, and you have to have a sense of humor. Yeah. I remember th these guys would be drilling for the, you know, in a solid oak door, a solid mahogany. I mean, this the, the drill bit, you know, doing the drill bit for the hinges. And then they undo it really quick and they could hear, hold this. And this thing would be hot as coal. And they would love me going, ah, you know, like this. Oh, they love pranking me. So, you know, just just kind of like don't worry about it. It's just the it, – it's an intense industry like anything because, you know, you're working with tools that you could get hurt on these jobs, you know, and there's an intensity about go do this, this, you know, and time is of the essence. So if you're going into the trade, be on time, be accountable. Don't, you know, try not to drink on the jobs. You know, that's another thing, you know, <laughs> like you're going to miss that. You know, just try to be accountable if you're going to get in there um, and and love what you do, because if you love what you do, you're going to be good at it and um, and 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 have, you know, if you're good at what you do and you like what you do. You're going to have some pride about leaving a job, clean up after yourself. The people that really like, um, and when people, I've been hired, you know, on different talk shows, they say, you know, what's the trick about when you hire a carpenter, you know, when you hire a contractor, what did she look for? And I said, well, first of all, communication. So be communicative. You know, people can't read your mind. And if you can't show up at nine o'clock on Tuesday because this other job, call them. Like, it's important to like, be communicative because that's what people are looking for. And, you know, clean up after yourself and have some respect, you know, for yourself and for your environment. So those are the people that I've noticed have done very well because it's all about word of mouth. This is an industry that if you want to get jobs, be good at the job. You don't always have to be the, the, the lowest bid on the job. So I always say to people, listen, don't always hire the lowest because you might get what you pay for. Hire somebody who has good references, you know, and who's going to show up on time when they come in and to do something. Make sure that they show up within 15, 20 minutes of when they said they are. And they have good communication because that'll sa save you alone. Uh, in any kind of uh, renovations that you're doing. Good point. I have a uh, a good buddy here um, in the Columbus area that has a construction business, and he is very um, detailed and thorough in his work. And, and really, he, he doesn't do like a lot of big construction projects. It's more like residential basement refinishing and stuff like that. Right. But he, he's never had a website or anything. Uh, because the quality of his work has always been so high that he just he stays super busy solely based on word of mouth referrals. Right. Yeah. Um, so you have been involved with many television shows, podcasts, book authorship and even comedy. Um, are there any projects that you're working on right now? Well, let me shamelessly plug my podcast. <laughs> I can't really see it. What does it say? It says Peculiar Places. That's your podcast, huh? Yeah. So my friend Julia and I, we do a, 
we both have a penchant for like crazy, you know, places and whatever. So we go around and then the, uh, the pandemic hit. So it kind of put the kibosh on that, but we're starting to, you know, rev up the uh, engines again and go to some more places, but I'm doing that. Um, I'm also, I had to take care of my folks here in Florida and uh, my mom just went off to heaven. She was the last of the two. Um, and, uh, so I kind of feel like, well, I could do anything anywhere now, you know, I'm taking care of, uh, uh, that. And I thought that was very important to me. And, um, I don't know, I would love to do another, I would love to do another television show. I would love to, um, do a very fun television show in home improvement. Well, I have a feeling something will probably come your way and you will say yes and just go with it. <laughs> Right. They'll say, do you know how to do something? And I'll go, yeah, I sure do. (laughs) Right. Oh, that's great. Well, we are uh, getting close to the end of our time here. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, Before we close out, I have to ask if you would like to participate in our rapid fire questions. These are seven questions that can range from serious to silly, and your only commitment is to provide a short answer to each one. Our audience needs to understand that if Linda agrees to this, she has no idea what we are going to ask. So, Linda, are you up for the challenge of rapid fire? I guess so. Yes. Why not? You can't really say no, can you? I can't say no at this point, right? I'm telling you, I'd say yes at everything. Awesome. Okay, here we go. Awesome. All right. Well, Ethan and I are going to alternate questions here, and I'm going to let him kick things off. Okay. All right. So what's the most recent book you read? Uh, I was starting to read Educated. Educated? Yeah. Who's that by? Uh, I don't know. It's in the other room. That's all right. I'll look it up. We'll put it in the show notes. Okay. And then the other, the, I have two books about UFOs right next to my bed. Ooh, interesting. That was a, a topic on an episode we recorded a couple of weeks ago. Oh, really? Have you guys ever seen a UFO? I have not. I believe I have, yes. Okay, I've seen two things, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Interesting. That could probably be a whole nother episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we could probably tie it into how they're built somehow, how they're constructed, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Do you have a hidden talent that is unrelated to construction? Gee whiz, I can make the sound of a water droplet. Will you do it for us? Oh, interesting. Wait a minute. There it is. That was good. Awesome. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Question three. What's the number one thing on your bucket list? I think my big thing right now is to, to, to get out and travel right now. I really, I feel like traveling and seeing my people. I have so many friends all over the country. I just need to, I feel like time's running out. We're talking about nuclear stuff on television. And I'm like, holy cow, you know, pandemic. So I feel like time is of the essence to all of this doesn't matter. It's all the heart stuff with the people we love, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's the weirdest thing you have ever eaten? I eat almost anything. I'm one of those people that I can go any country, anywhere. I went to China for my tool line. I went to China and I had some really odd things there. Um, and I, <laughs> I, we, we, they took me to a place called Hot Pot. And uh, I don't know what it was called, but that's what we had. But it was like going to PetSmart and like picking out your food. <laughs> like, you know, like what animal do you want? Like it was so strange. <laughs> you know i had like shrimp doing this it was like they were skewered here and they were doing this and i was like (laughs) oh no um and of course i ate it i mean i'm pretty adventurous when it comes to stuff like that so i don't know i i would eat like chocolate covered bug or whatever cricket yeah, it sounds like a that place sounds like a vegan's worst nightmare. So <laughs> it's no, seriously. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Um, all right. So if you ever had a yacht, what would you name it? Um Bring in the Joy. What's your favorite board game? Oh, I just got um Backgammon. That's it. Hmm. Yeah. I like backgammon. I just got a new backgammon. It was a gift. I just got given a really nice backgammon. So when's the last time you guys played backgammon? It's a great game. I know it is. I used to play when I was younger at my grandma and grandpa's house, but I probably have not played it for over 30 years. And I don't know that I would remember how to. Yeah, I used to play with my dad probably probably 10 years ago. It's been a while. 
You know what's nice about backgammon? It doesn't take all the brain work of chess. So it's a good game to, you know, look at and play and also have a conversation, which is what I like about it. You don't have to be super focused on it. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I've had a chess set in my Amazon cart for a while because I want to teach my kids how to play chess, but maybe backgammon would be a good middle ground before we go to chess. You know what's great about the backgammon too? Like chess, if you lose, you're an idiot, right? It's just because you're an idiot. But, you know, <laughs> well, at least with backgammon, you know, you lose because you didn't get the right role. You know? Yeah, you can blame it on something else. Yeah. Can't blame yourself on all of there's it. A nice, there's a nice dignity like exit on that. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Um, if you had to eat a crayon, what color would you choose? Oh, probably magenta. Ooh. Okay. Interesting. Why? Because it's the highest vibrating color. On the, on the color spectrum. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting answer. That's one of my, the first time we asked that on the podcast, I was, I was all for it. Cause I'm like, that's totally random and weird, but I love the responses we've gotten from people about what, what color and why. So. And what's yours? What, what are you all's favorite color? I, I'd go with red. Red, right? Yeah. Okay. I still think blue would be kind of interesting, so I'll go with blue. <laughs> I have a feeling they all taste like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. Maybe some company can invent edible crayons that taste like their color. There you go, yeah. <laughs> well, th this has been fun. Uh, thank you again so much for your time today. It's been a, a real pleasure and privilege to chat with you. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to share with our audience? The only thing I can say is for those who are listening who feel like oh well she can do it but I kind of can't you know do it as far as like working with your hands or whatever you don't have to be perfect just you know just go for it and try it um you know I am fairly accessible you can find me on the internet you know um but look up on YouTube too look up and you know just take a take a stab at it, you know. Seriously, it's a what what I su suggest to my friends uh, and as guys too. By the way, this is not just for women, but um, just try it. Just try to figure it out. You know, look on, and at least if you don't do it yourself, you understand it, which is like also half of it, I think. So, and I also feel that when I work uh, with my hands. I feel closer and connected to this magic in this universe. So there is something to that. And there is something beautiful about that. I mean, wh whose who's father, uh, grandfather was a farmer? My father-in-law. A father-in-law. He probably taught your uh, wife that, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She, she can call the cows in like nobody's yeah. business. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> One of the first times I went to their house, she told me, they they were talking about calling the cows and I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, there's a call that we do. And then they all come running and I'm like, do it, do it. And I had my phone out because I was going to record it. And she, she would not do it as long as I had the phone on. But, but, um, once I turned it off, she did it and her dad did it. And sure enough, they came running from acres away and it was pretty cool. But yeah. Can you just please tell me what it kind of sounded like? <sighs> Um, it's not anything really weird. It's more just like a, I, I don't know that I could do it. It's kind of like a howl or something that really, yes. And, and I don't know if that's for all cows or if that's just how their cows respond, uh, because her dad does it, but I don't know. But that's cool. It wasn't super weird or anything. It was just, I didn't know that you could yeah. like howl, make this sound and the cows would come running to you. Right. Sorry. Random way to end the podcast there. <laughs> <laughs> so for uh, anybody that would like to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, just uh, reach out lindalyday.com, L-Y-N-D-A-L-Y-D-A-Y.com. Okay. And you are pretty easy to find online as well. Pretty, pretty easy. Yeah. We will leave some uh, links in the show notes for that. Thank you. So thank you so much for uh, your time again today. Um, and to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Construction Disruption with Linda Lyde, America's home improvement expert. Please watch for future episodes of our podcast. We have more great guests on tap. And if you could take a quick two minutes to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, we would greatly appreciate it. 
Until then, change the world for someone, make them smile and encourage them. Two of the most powerful things we can do to change the world. God bless and take care. This is Isaiah Industries signing off until the next episode of Construction Disruption. Disruption.